Here we are again, the Various and Numerous podcast, episode 55, today with a special guest, co-founder of Saito, uh, David Lancashire. How are you doing today, sir? It's, it's been a long day, uh, and it's at the end of it, so I don't know how cogent I'll be, but um, I, I'm in your hands, man. And so, <laughs> All right. Thank, yeah, you, for inviting, thank you for inviting me on, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, got when do you guys, uh, maybe a few months back, I don't know the exact date or anything like that. I didn't write it down in my journal or anything, but, uh, my diary, but, uh, yeah, you guys are definitely taking uh, Twitter by storm now. Um, I actually picked up some, uh, Saito, Sato, how, however you pronounce it, tomato, tomato. Uh, maybe you can tell us some correct, correct, uh, pronunciation. It's, it's, it's both ways. We've got, <laughs> um, one of our early supporters, he asked us that and, uh, I went back and I checked, you know, like I love Inception and it's kind of related to that. And we went back and checked and they say it both ways in the movie. So whatever you want to go with is fine. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I picked up some, uh, the, uh, tokens and, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a believer in what you guys are trying to do. At least, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to see what happens here in the next, uh, however long that I decide to mm. watch what's going on and, uh, put a little bit of faith in you guys, because I think what you're trying to do is interesting. So I wanted to have you on and have a discussion and ask you some more questions about it myself. So definitely appreciate your time. You're on the other side of the world. So, uh, I think there's a 12 hour difference, right? Yeah, it's the end of the day. It's going to be a rough one. <laughs> it's going to be okay. long. It's not early. It keeps going. Uh, but uh, hopefully bedtime after this. So I'll make it as painless as I can. Let's just jump right into it here. So you guys are trying to basically uh, reinvent the wheel or whatever you want to say. Um, there's some inherent problems with proof of work and um, proof of stake uh, models in the blockchain uh, uh, world, uh, the crypto sector, then those are the two main um, main models that uh, everybody basically has been building upon for the last, uh, let's see, 14 years now, 13, 14 years. So um, can you just like tell us a little bit like, um, a I don't wanna to spend too much time on every question, but this is, this is obviously one of the more important ones right off the bat. Uh, I've seen you talk about it. Vitalik laid out, you know, this thing called the blockchain trilemma, which you guys have said uh, is not really a trilemma because you, you've solved it. So could you just explain what that is briefly for the people that might not know and, you know, to get straight into it about what you did to solve it? Okay, so we're talking about the trilemma. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what is the trilemma? Um, the trilemma is that there are three things that are uh, their scale. Scale is the raw number of bytes being processed by the network. Decentralization is essentially the number of computers on the network that are processing those bytes. And security is the cost of attacking the blockchain. So what Vitalik was looking at was he's got proof of work and proof of stake, and they give all of their money to the security function. And he knows he needs to pay for other stuff. You need to pay the network nodes. You need to pay for Infura. But however he tries to play jiggery pokery with the money flows and the cryptography, whatever he does that gets the money from the security providers to anyone else tends to lower security. And so he looks as he says, it looks like we've got a trilemma. And there's actually, in computer science, there's a, a, a two-way trade-off, too, between scale and decentralization, right? And so the question is, okay, well, what is this? Because a lot of the time, people will say, they like, people love drawing triangles. Have you noticed? Like, they'll just draw a triangle, and it's like, here is atomic composability, and there is, like, uh, permissionless, you know, permissionless DeFi or something. You know, just three random things. It's become a crypto thing. Right. But, like... So the question is, okay, we've got the idea that there's a trade-off. What is that trade-off? In classical computer science with scale and decentralization, it's a problem with money because you've got a limited amount of money to run a network. And if you upgrade your computers so they can process more bytes, you can't buy as many computers. And if you, conversely, if you buy more computers, they're all on worse hardware. And you can think about this in the sense that like, if you can get volunteers to do everything, 
you don't have a trilemma. Like it's clearly an economic problem because like if it wasn't an economic problem, your solution to the trilemma would be get some volunteers to set up more machines, have some miners volunteer a bit more electricity and hash power, and everyone volunteers to upgrade their, their hardware, problem is solved. So the fundamental insight is that we're dealing with an economic problem, which is caused by a finite budget. Am I making sense? It's not Absolutely. Good, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. And the problem is that, okay, scale and decentralization, we understand, right? And, but security in proof of work and proof of stake depends on the amount of money you throw at miners and stakers, because it depends on the return on interest or return on investment you can offer them. Uh, so it's like for every dollar you throw at your mining and staking function, it's like 50 cents of cost of attack. So Vitalik's problem is he wants to maximize security, but if he takes money away from mining and staking and gives it to anyone else, well, he can have more scale, he can have more decentralization, but security has gone down. That is fundamentally uh, the big picture of what the trilemma is. And the solution is, well, you, you, can, you can solve the three-way trade-off by at least reducing it back to the two-way trade-off. So what Saito does is we actually get security from paying for network nodes. So the money that in proof of work and proof of stake needs to go to miners. And so it doesn't pay, it doesn't pay for the network operations. In Saito, it goes to these network nodes. Um, and the consequences of, that, of, of this, uh, and specifically the fact that the net, what the network nodes need to do to get paid means that the security trilemma breaks apart in some fundamental ways. Uh, I, I can walk you through some thought experiments, but you know, uh, like people think the trilemma means different things. So I don't want to jump into like in this situation, here's an example of how it, it fixes it. Um, I think the big picture view of if you can get security from paying for the network, you don't have a three-way trade-off. You've got a two-way trade-off. And so the, it's not a trilemma. And, you know, people can get confused because they can look and they'll be like, but there's still a scale and decentralization trade-off. And it's like, yes, there is. You're stuck with that trade-off, but you're not stuck with this more expensive three-way trade-off. So the network is also way more efficient with money. That is how's, a good idea. Yeah, it's a good explanation. Is there a specific part of your white paper that breaks down like the technical uh, process more like you could actually look at it and see, you know what I'm talking about? Like the, what do you mean when you say technical process? Are you looking for a description of, you want to talk about how the network works? Like, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I I have the white paper here. um, Just a little bit more on the, um, sorry, I'm trying to share my screen here. Um, Yeah, just a little bit more on how the network works, maybe. Sure. How about this? Let's start with the problem. Vitalik wants to pay for routing nodes. Okay. He wants to pay for the nodes in the network. And and so the question is, well, why can't you do this? Like, why didn't Bitcoin do it? Why didn't the the proof of stake networks? Why don't they do it? And the answer is, well, you're reducing your security budget and you don't have any information in an open and distributed system about who's doing this work. So you can't even identify, like in a distributed open system, uh, if someone shows up with a hash, I know that they've done the, the, the mining. And if they show up claiming to have stake, I can check inside my database and say, oh yeah, they do have stake, they've done the work. But when it comes to, oh, hey man, I brought this money into the network. How do you even know, one, that they did it? And two, how do you know it's not their money? And So the naive thing of, oh, well, let's pay for servers, let's pay for this, like Vitalik is smart. And he knows that if you're basically giving money to people and you can't, they can't prove they've done the work, you could be giving money to an attacker. So that's the fundamental problem. It's not like a lot, because a lot of people we notice, we talk to them about Saito and how we pay for network nodes. And they go, well, you know, doesn't Dash do that? Or doesn't BCH do that? Mm -hmm. And you know, there are various ways that networks do it, but all of them have trusted third parties or it reduces security. And the way Sato does it, it actually increases security. So if you understand that, I'm happy to walk you through like, well, well, what's going on? 
Yeah, just are, are, are we good for this? Yeah, yeah I think yeah. I think we're getting to that. Yeah, we're getting there. Okay. Well, first we need information on who's done the work. And so what we do is we add to transactions a routing signature as they go into the network. So let's say I'm a user and you are my pure node. If I send you a transaction, I'm gonna go, okay, I'm cryptographically signing that it goes to you. And if you make a block or if you send it to someone else, you'll cryptographically sign and say, okay, it goes to them. And at some point, someone puts that transaction into a block. We now have objective information about who collected all of the money and who they got it from. So this is, it's a form of, it's a, a new form of information that doesn't exist in uh, old classical proof of work and proof of stake blockchains. And I think they're going to add them because I think it's the only real way we can scale and pay for infrastructure in a way that like, doesn't just invite companies and governments in to crush us. So the, real quick, sorry to, inter sorry to interrupt you. Well, that, that would, yeah. if they were to uh, incorporate that, that would have to be done on like another layer, right? Well, they need like with Bitcoin, the problem is uh, like they don't, you don't, you need routing SIGs on the network layer, right? Like when I send you the data, it needs to be sent to you. And when you send it to someone else, you need to sign it too. So, you know, and like Ethereum, a lot of these projects, they're doing things like they're using libraries like libp2p. And those libraries are just not capable of, they're not capable of this. So the basic tools that other projects are using would, would need to be upgraded. But, you know, they, they could, like you could even get bad versions of it, like sign for the first hop. And then the first hop is eligible for 5% or something, you know, like it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. Right. But if you think about this, we've got a problem though, because what Saito does is it says, look, one of the ways we have to solve fundamental problems is we got to measure the amount of work you're doing from the, from the money, from the fee, right? Uh, the other blockchains, it's kind of like go out and burn hash or, or go out and buy stake. And then we'll get, we'll give you the right to produce a block and you'll get the profit from producing the block. And we expect that that profit will pay for what you need to spend with maybe 3% of a profit margin. Now, as soon as you have that external market, you've got a problem because you've got a voting system and it's open and permissionless. You have no idea what's happening in that external market. You can buy and sell. Uh, you can buy and sell hash. You can buy and sell stake. People are, oh, no, I'm going to get slashed. It's like, okay, we'll put insurance on that. Um, you can have people colluding. You can have miners colluding. Uh, right. There's all kinds of really weird and nasty things that can happen. And nobody knows because it's, trust, it's, it's permissionless. Right? Well, Saito gets rid of that external market and we turn it into the money. And so what happens is as the transactions go around the network, nodes collect them in their mempool. And as they collect them in their mempool, if you've been signed that transaction, it's kind of like you get a little bit of extra work and the work builds up in your mempool until you have enough to produce a block. And then you produce a block. Now, Anybody who knows proof of work and proof of stake is going to, I see a problem with this. Yes. One, everyone can produce a block at the same time. What's the other finality? Slower finality? Is well, like you know, transactions are flowing into the network. People are sharing them. So everyone's mempool is kind of going up at the same time. That's a problem, right? That's like everyone can produce, you know, it, it creates block flooding attacks. And one of the things you want to do is you want to prevent there from being like 500 blocks coming out at the same time. And like attackers like on BSV just, or maybe BCH or something like that. Right. Like, and especially with big blocks, because you don't want an attacker, like you don't want an attacker sending 20 people, $500,000, and then they all produce a block at the same time. Right. So that's one problem is that the trend, you know, there's, there's no decay function. The second problem though is look, we've created a circular economic system. Uh, it's exactly the same as renting hash, producing a block, paying for your hash rental out of the income you get from producing the longest chain. Like the money can loop in a circle. So I can use my own money to attack the network by moving it in circles, right? Um, these attacks are possible in proof of work and proof of stake, but people don't really talk about them because there's no solution. So people, people are like, oh, it's impossible to rent hash. You'll never be able to rent hash. 
And it's like, well, when the block reward's dead, you will be able to write hash because there won't be that much hash. Uh, and, you know, like stake is literally an economic commodity. And so you've got these real economic problems in proof of work and proof of stake where like you're not going to get more hash than, there, than the block reward pays for because the block reward is buying electricity. But 51% of that electricity can buy up to 100% of income if you've got people colluding. So the incentives are promoting this sort of financial collusion. And we don't really know where it goes with Bitcoin. We like to say Bitcoin's kind of an economic test now. Let's see what happens. But to give you an example, these are the kind of problems that uh, a mechanism like Saito that has fees, you're going to run into. And I think it's one of the reasons proof of stake people, they kind of, you know, someone might hit this and they're like, well, I don't get it. There's obvious, obvious problems. They can spin money in circles. Or they can, if money is all it takes to produce a block, I'm just going to produce a block and get paid and do it again. Like, what are they smoking, these guys? So these are the problems that Saito solves. Saito solves the problem of fee circularity in a blockchain. And what we're going to do is we're going to use these routing SIGs so that if you use your own money to make a block, you're going to bleed out. But... If you use money that belongs to someone else, it's pure profit. So that's what we're aiming for. Um, you have any questions? Because I think the next thing is just to say, how do we fix that problem with the transaction six? No, no, just continue on. That's, yeah, you're, okay. That, that was a very, so, that's the best uh, I've seen you explain it, to be honest. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Then we're going to publicize this as, as broadly as we can. Absolutely. So I send you a transaction. Mm -hmm. And the fee that I attach becomes the measure of work. So you can think of it like a hash in Bitcoin. And when you get it, you can check the difficulty of the hash and that's how much work you have to produce the block. When you send it to someone else though, we've got two hops. And when it arrives in their mempool, it's worth half as much. So if they wanna produce a block, they need to collect twice as much work as what you're giving them. And there's something really interesting here because all of a sudden something fundamentally changes. Like with Bitcoin, you don't want to share transactions because anyone could randomly produce the block. But with routing work, well, I want to actually get you that transaction because I've got a better chance of making a block than you. So if I get lucky or if you're doing no work, I'm going to produce a block before you and I'm going to get paid. But I don't know who else has this transaction. And I'm scared that if two people have it, someone else will make a block before me. And in that case, my best strategy is to get this transaction to you and get this transaction to other people because maybe you'll be faster than them. And if you are faster than them, maybe I can get some of that money. So what we do is as the transactions propagate into the network, the value of the transaction for making a block goes down and down and down. This is where Sado, Sado, it kills civil attacks. What's a civil attack in the network? A civil attack is someone, it's like someone who sits between you and me and decides if they're going to forward blocks and decides if they're going to forward transactions. Now, if we have a good relationship and someone comes and tries to park in between us, you are not going to use the transactions they send you. And you're going to look and you're going to be like, look, David, just send me the transactions directly because we don't need this guy. He's making all of us poorer. I need to, I need to increase. I need to pay a much higher fee for you to have the same chance to produce a block because the routing path is longer. So the routing paths self-optimize. And if someone wants to sibyl the network, they've literally got to find the transaction flow to justify it. And where can they do that? Well, either they can be an honest node and make money as an honest node. That's no problem. Or they've got to spend their own money. And they've got to spend as much as the transaction flow that I give them, they've got to match it sending it to you for you to care. So we've got this decay on work. And what happens is eventually someone is going to produce a block. And what we think will happen, uh, like we're not, we're not sure because the network is growing, we're, you know, we're doing this. We think that what's going to happen is we're going to get this round robin. But it's like a round robin that's emergent. Because like proof of stake, they, they close a staking table and they've got these points of attack 
right? Like if someone controls the staking table and you try to stake, they're like, no, go away. We're not, we're not putting your transaction on the chain. So you can't even come in. And like their, their motive, their, their idea is this attacker outside the system trying to get in. And it's like, no, 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 no. In the financial system, you should be afraid of the people running the show, you know, because it's, totally guys that, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like it's the idealists. Um, anyway, so uh, we've got the transactions propagating in. Somebody produces a block mm -hmm. and we think it's going to be emergent round robin because like if I have the ability to produce a block and I do that, my mempool drops down to zero and I got to start building work again. So I produce a block and all of the nodes near me probably have similar work and they, so we all go to zero. And then there's the guy in the States who's connected to Google, who's running on a, on a California Wilshire facility. And like his mempool is still high because he's got a bunch of US transactions that didn't go in. So somebody produces a block, it goes around the network. Now we've gotten to the second problem, which is how the hell uh, at this point, let's say we, we're just going to burn the fees. If we burn all of the fees, we're secure. It's like Bitcoin, right? Like you, you're going to run out of money, but uh, the cost, you're basically saying, look, to make a block, you got to lock up fees and they go away. And so you can collect honest user fees and that's great. Or you can use your own money, but you're burning, you're burning the money. We got a cost of attack. As soon as we produce a block though, and as soon as we want to bring that money back, we're getting to this fee circularity thing, right? Like with proof of stake, people have come up with ways of, oh, we're going to have randomness in this way or randomness in that way. The problem is all of these can be gamed, right? Because if I'm an attacker, I can control what goes into the block. So why can't I just manipulate the block in a way that it will pay me? Why can't I attack the lottery? And this is where we love proof of work. And one of the lessons of proof of work is that mining is a costly function to generate randomness. Okay, we're gonna use it, but we're gonna do something really clever. The block is produced, everything's burned. And then we say, okay, well, you know what the block is? We broadcast it and we broadcast, we don't know who's gonna get paid, but you've got an incentive to broadcast it because the only way you're gonna get paid is if you broadcast it. Uh, as soon as it's broadcast, then the miners will start to try to find a mining solution. And we call this the golden ticket. And the idea is that if you find a golden ticket and you include it in the very next block, when the next block is produced, that block producer looks to the block that we made and they take the randomness in the golden ticket and they use that to pick a transaction in our block. And we're going to weigh these transactions according to the amount of fees and the, the amount of fees that they have, right? Um, so it randomly is going to pick one transaction. Then we hash that random number again, and we pick using the second random number, one of the routing nodes. And we're going to weigh your chances of winning based on where you are in the routing path. So if there's two nodes, uh, the second node is, again, it's going to have half the chance of winning as the first. And it's going to go drop by half, drop by half. So the further along give, the transaction history. If there's it, it basically, yeah, it's like, like a half every, every trans. Exactly. Okay. So if there's two nodes, the first node has a 66% chance of winning. And the second node has a 33% chance of winning. Okay. The second node, by the way, is the block producer. So we're paying for block production here, but the user facing node, it's got a really good chance of getting paid. So because of the way, but if it's three, if it's three nodes, it's like 57% and then like 27% and then 14 or, or something like that. Right. Um, it approaches the point where like you can, it's an infinity series. It's never going to be that way because eventually people will be like, my chance of making any money is nothing. Right. Um, but we say two things. We say, look, if you put a transaction in the block and it's not connected to you, you're, you have no chance of getting paid. But the people in that routing path have a chance of getting paid. And if you've removed the routing path, we're going to say that the guy that sent the transaction has all of the work. So there's something fascinating here because attackers, they actually want to be collecting other people's money. 
And if they are collecting other people's money and they're doing the thing that the ways they cheat in Bitcoin proof of work, they're putting other people's transactions into their blocks. Mm -hmm. If they do that, they're putting transactions in their block that statistically are most likely to pay other people. And so if they want to outcompete the honest network, they need to take their own money and make some fake transactions and they put that in the block. But then we have to play the lottery game. And the lottery game is statistically way more likely to play other to pay other people than it is to pay themselves. And so what this game does is it puts the attacker in a situation where you're essentially in a catch-22. Um, the easiest way to produce a block is to spend your own money, right? Because your own money is the most efficient way to create high-value routing work that will statistically pay you. Mm -hmm. But if you do this, when it comes time to pay for the hashing costs, it's all coming out of your pocket. You can't like include other transactions like a 51% attack and be like, well, you know, we're all getting paid uh, this amount. I'm getting paid proportional to hash, but I'm getting extra money because I'm attacking the system. Um, does this make sense? I kind of feel, yeah. yeah. No, so, so you're basically disincentivizing them to even, the bad actors to even show up to the to your network from the onset. Well, it's the beautiful thing about solving the problem. We're solving the 51% attack, if that's not clear. Because what the 51% the attack is fixing the thing that breaks when someone has 51%. And what breaks is, before that point, pay is proportional to work. But after that point, there are things you can do where your pay is not proportional to the work you've done. Because you can play games or you can collude. And once you've got that kind of influence, there's a ton of ways to cause damage. You can, like, a big miner can be like, you share your transactions with me, but I'm not going to share mine with you. And then the big miners are more profitable. Right. Or you've got to give me, uh, you know, these kind of latency terms, but, you know, you know I'm, I'm going to take my time with some block withholding and there's nothing you can do. Um, anyway, anyway, back to maybe the transaction explanation, we got to pick the winner. And so we've got this loaded and weighted lottery. And the first thing you can do is I use my own money to make a block. Well, you are paying the hashing costs. It's a total loss. You've got other options though. You could try, you could try to make other transactions and put them in your block. And the problem, and you could say, well, look, I'm going to attack the payment lottery because the payment lottery is fair. It's fair if mining is fair and we think mining is fair. If you attack the payment lottery though, because of the way the payouts go, mm -hmm. you need to find more golden tickets. Uh, like if 50% if of the fees in the block aren't yours, uh, you got a minimum 50% chance of paying someone else which means to break even on average, you need two golden tickets. So people can go through the math. We've got a complicated math paper that does stats on, on the production. It is like a nice little curve. And what it shows is if you're an attacker, you're always losing money. You can choose how you lose money, but you're always losing money. Um, so it's kind of like we've moved from a voting system where 51% can give themselves all the money they want in a lot of different ways to a system where if you're voting at all on anything that pays you privately, it's going to cost you more than you can collect. And the outcome is a game where if you're an honest node, you're routing transactions happily and you're getting paid a fraction of the block reward. And like, if anyone tries to attack you, it's beautiful. Like if I'm sending you a transactions as a routing node and you decide to attack the payment lottery, why am I sending you money? My immediate incentive is to send it to someone else because, well, I don't want you producing blocks. You're not following the rules. Mm -hmm. And if I send my transactions to someone else, I actually get paid more for them. So the entire network now, everyone in the network has an incentive to do the right thing. And that's not something that happens in proof of work and proof of stake. Um, uh, you know, and it also would increase the security. Because like if someone's attacking the network, okay, stop sending them money. Like imagine Google, Google producing 80% of blocks. If they try to produce 100%, they'll have a cost of attack. But if, if they even try that, what are people going to do? They're going to be like, okay, Baidu, I'm going to send it to you because why would I send Google money and accept less than the network will guarantee? 
That, like I said, that's the best explanation I've heard uh, so far about just I've listened to quite a few of your podcasts. You guys are on the tour right now. You, you and Richard are hitting it pretty, pretty hard, getting getting the message out there. The, the community's great, man. Uh, and I really appreciate you you hitting me up because um, like people who've got a genuine interest, we love to talk. We love to talk about it because we want people to know about this. Yeah, I'm not like, a developer, but I find this stuff so interesting. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm enjoying this a lot right now. And uh, grateful for your time let's move let's let's i got so many questions here let's just move on that was a good explanation that you feel like you did a yeah uh the, did it justice there you know we'll we'll see <laughs> what, yeah. what does he say you know all right yeah we can't please everyone hopefully uh, everybody got a better understanding after that uh that still had some questions so um like i said i've i've been i've been following this now for a few months but i don't know everything about it so um how long did it take you to like when was your uh, when was your uh, what's your blockchain origin story and when did you decide that you were going to uh, tackle this issue? Uh, Richard and I were in China, uh, uh, mainland China. Um, I you know you do visa trips to exit the country. Um, we were in uh, the crypto community and I think you know like the block size wars were crazy, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> but you could have serious discussions and I think that changed. You know, and I think it's for the worst. So I'm hoping one of the things Saito does is it introduces people to the idea so they can suddenly think and see, well, wait a minute, you know, what's happened? But, you know, I'd spend a lot of time in Hong Kong, really interested in doing things with crypto. Um, I was interested in like VPN apps or, you know, all of this stuff. And it just kept coming back to, we need a scalable blockchain that doesn't hard code data formats. And I think there was, and the starting point was an intuitive sense. Well, we need to pay nodes in the network. And the work has to be derived from the money that you collect. And then it's a lot of really, really, really hard thinking, a lot of walking, because no matter what you, no matter, you know, how you walked around the maze, you ended up back in the same position and it would break. Um, So like in describing the problems to you just now, I'm kind of describing part of the thought process that I think anyone who's thinking about these go-throughs goes through. And also like you hit this point and you're like, well, it doesn't work because money recycling attacks, you know? Um, and most people stop there, right? Mm-hmm. They run into one problem. They're like, okay, well, this approach won't work. And I think because of the environment that we were in, uh, a strong environment, uh, a desire to solve these problems and a willingness to think about it, we, we kind of got through them. And you eventually get to this point in the maze where you're like, you turn the corner and it looks like a dead end. You walk down there and it turns and it's another dead end. But when you walk to the end, there's a breath of fresh air. And you're like, well, maybe I'm not in the dead end. And you think about it and you find something. And then you spend the next three months basically going, what the hell is wrong with us? Because there's got to be something wrong with us. And things are moving in the model that don't move in proof of work and proof of stake, right? Like the amount of work it takes to produce a block, the amount of money it takes, like this is varying. Consensus is saying, well, this amount of fees would be good if Job came up with it. But this amount of fees is bad because Hank came up with it and he's deeper in the network. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of thinking about this. Uh, I was in correspondence with Richard. Uh, I remember hitting one, it was one point, and I'm like, Richard, I'm having the hardest time trying to figure out how to identify a remote node in the network. I'm thinking about it in the blockchain context, right? I'm hitting the same problems as Vitalik. And, and Richard's like, oh, I'll just use Raving6. And so I go away and then like <laughs> a day and a half later, I write about like, Richard, you're a genius. You know, it works. Uh, you know, this is maybe it's possible, you know. Uh, and then, he, you know, later on, he's like, dude, if I knew you were asking about blockchain, there's no way I would have said that because your context would be a peer to peer routing network that doesn't do it. You know, um, yeah, that's it. So you guys found that you, you found blockchain around like what, 2014, you said or something like that. Is that when you first got interested or was it before that? Uh, my first purchase was at eight bucks and I gave half to an ex-girlfriend and I lost half in a Beijing cat, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can find the signing key. And I, you know, I think like, what do you mean you lost it in a Beijing cab? What is it? The boating accident? It's the Beijing boating accident. <laughs> that. No, that's uh, good. That's good. I like that. My, uh, my initial Bitcoin, uh, fell victim to a hard, a hard drive failure on an old Mac mini. So, um, I know, yeah. I know, I know about the Beijing cabs and stuff. Um, 
Well, no, no, it's it's, it's true. Uh, <laughs> I know, so is mine. Well, uh, so uh, I, I've messed around with uh, Red Square a little bit, which is pretty cool. I uh, made an account there the other day for the people that don't know. Let me pull Red Square up now too. Go, go to staging. Uh, we're about to put the staging network onto Prod. Um, staging's better because uh, the old Red Square, it's like, it, you know, it's kind of buggy. The red cases, it's hard to use. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I've been I've just been messing around with it a little bit, and um, hmm. pretty cool. You can see what, you see what we're doing. Uh, the better one, the the new one works better. It's simpler, less buggy. So is this is this technically still testnet or is this mainnet now? I mean, you know, we don't really think of it this way. We think that like it's kind of like Ethereum. Is Ethereum in mainnet? Like right. you're going to continue to hard fork. I think people want token permanence because the idea is it's not in mainnet if I can't be whacking tokens around on chain. Right. And <clears throat> we don't really think like that. Token permanence is coming later this year. Um, for us, building the applications and getting the usage up and getting the utility up is super important because transaction fees secure the network. And one of the consequences of fee routing is we can't have a big block reward because having a big block reward is like, you got to burn money to produce a block. Maybe it's going to cost you, maybe you'll get paid. And then they produce a block and they open the door and there's a big fat pile of cash on the desk. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a structural problem right, um, right. that we have. And so we want to build utility. We're building apps, we're building games. And then eventually the growth strategy is actually put up an ad faucet and use that to get the tokens to people. And then the network consensus will get those tokens to the ISPs running applications. Basically, um, sort of how, well, not sort of, exactly how Bitcoin bootstrap value in the beginning, like with faucets and stuff. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin's the model because Bitcoin's also the network that came into a world that didn't understand it with something fundamental. Right. Um, like we think it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cyto. Uh, but, you know, obviously we're, obviously we're biased, but we think that fundamentals matter. Right. Um, you know, we look at other networks, we just, we see people tackling very narrow technical problems that are the result of these economic issues. And it's like, well, like governance, it's like, why do you have a governance problem? Like that's a, you're introducing state solutions. Bitcoin solution is a market. Like you don't need to govern people if you can make it unprofitable for them to do the, to, for them to do the bad things, right? That's what Saito is. Um, if we can make it unprofitable, we just got to fix this point where that rule, that, that possibility breaks with Bitcoin. Um, yeah, it's very cool. I, I love, I love the concept. Well, how many, how many uh, developers you guys, how many people are working on it like day to day? Are you guys full time on um, it? Um, we're, we're, full, we're full time. I mean, we're a much smaller team than I think people realize. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've got like four devs working kind of on the UI. That includes me. Um, we've got, maybe two people that touch the rust wasm stuff right now so i'd say like six core developers including richard and myself um most of the efforts going in the apps right now um because uh because rust is really it's a joy it's a joy to work with and wasm and webpack if you're technical um so but, is, that, uh, is that is that one of the things that you wish uh is that maybe one of the only downfalls to the project rust or what Oh, no, no, I mean, it's fun. It's wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Web, it, it, it's more that like, have you seen that Spider-Man meme where Tobey Maguire is like holding the train and he's like, oh, uh, I don't know. Th that's our, that's our on-team Webpack, Jeff. <laughs> Anyone who has to deal with Webpack, especially with the Rust and Wasm, it's like you're walking into a disaster zone. You can get it working. And when it works, it's a dream. But uh it, it's not the it's not the most pleasurable thing to be tasked with if you've got to uh, patch it up or something. Not the um, easiest language to to mess manipulate. It, it's wonderful. I mean, Rust is it's it's great because you can do things like you can take a massive block and you put it in memory, mm -hmm. and you can say, okay, sixty four threads. You guys each validate one sixty fourth of the transactions, and it's read only, super fast. That's like if you're going with big blocks, that's what you want. Because you can't have them taking turns. It's way too slow. Um, Rust is brilliant for this. I, I, we love Rust. Um, 
All right, that, 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 was, a, that was also very, uh, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense now that you said that. Um, moving on, I got some, I got, I, I, we've already been going for 45 minutes. I want to make sure I hit some of these questions. That, there were so many questions on the thread I asked on Twitter. Uh, um, if anybody had some questions and we got, we got like a dozen good ones. So I want to at least ask like half of these. Uh, just real quick, moving on to the tokenomics. Uh, I know you guys have two different uh, coins. Can you just explain? I think it's red and yellow. Uh, the red and yellow token on so there's, there's ERC 20 and we uh, we bridged it to, uh, to be available on BSC because people wanted cheaper transaction fees, but it's, it's just the ERC 20 um, and people can technically, they can move the ERC 20 onto, onto the network if they want uh, for people doing dev. If you're not doing dev, it's kind of like a bit pointless to do that, but. Okay. And like, okay. It'll, make, it'll, make more, it'll make more sense in the, in the future. And especially like people are used to DeFi and staking and like APY and stuff. And it's like, look, even if you move it onto the network, uh, the amount of money you're going to make is going to depend on transaction volume and network activity. Cause it's the free market that's determining the outcomes. Not, not some like hot, hot wired tokenomics, you know, distribution right. scheme. I'm probably the most free market guy you're going to talk to. So I appreciate that. Uh, what, what is the, um, what, okay. So how are you, how are you guys, uh, basically where is the money coming from to develop it? Because I, I saw in a previous podcast, like I said, I did a little mm -hmm. bit of homework. I watched a lot of your interviews and a few of Richard's. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw you say that like, since I own Sato now, I'm not technically an investor that you guys aren't, I'm not like, that money isn't going to you like so do you guys well, it, not have it, it doesn't i mean if you've got an if you've got an open utility or an asset like you're not an investor like you haven't given us money you haven't signed a contract with us for investment. right um just to answer your questions directly um we did we got some support early on um because we're looking at this and we're like this is really revolutionary and how do we how do we how do we do this properly and it, you know, really tough. We started going to people and trying to find people that would help us build like, Hey, Bitmain, would you be interested in helping out with this? And, you know, 2017 ERC token boom, you know, people didn't understand it. Um, but we found some people eventually that did, uh, they helped us. So we did raise a seed round. They've been, uh, they've been issued their tokens at this point, um, at in 2001, we did uh, we did another sale that was in preparation for having things publicly available. And basically everyone, you know, they come and sign contracts. And what you do is you look for people who are willing to help get the word out and participate in some capacity, right? So you're looking for one person who's in Europe and one person who's in Asia. You're mm -hmm. looking for people who you can talk to, who can understand it and who can help communicate it to other people. Um, and you know, that's also one reason why, like, I don't think of it as an investment because like, you're really looking for partners who, uh, like it's, it's not a free ride, you know, it's not like you bought a U.S. treasury or something and you're sitting right. on it. It's like, you've got to do something. Um, is, you what, know, what, sorry, not to interrupt you. Anything. What, what, I just want to make sure we get through all these questions. What is the, um, what is the team's allocation of tokens? I'm not, I, 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 that's something I didn't get to. Oh, uh, okay, sure. I mean, I mean, what people should be thinking of right now if they're looking at it is assume there's about 3 billion in circulation mm -hmm. and uh, a bunch of that about like there's, there's 500 million that is foundation and dev. Like we don't have an interest really in, in, in touching this. Um, beyond that, once we get token persistence up, there is an additional like, 70% that is kind of allocated. And one of the reasons it's kind of allocated is because when you, you, you know, you want to tell people, look, th these are the limits of what it is, and this is how it's kind of organized. So technically Richard and I have tokens there. Um, we don't, we don't have ERC. I, I've got some, I bought some, I know Richard has some because he bought some, but like, it's not an allocation. Um, some member of the teams, like we've given them ERC twenties, um, you know, for, for dev purposes, but it's not like, uh, I, I don't think we've even done that from the team allocation. I think that's just like us. Um, so the tokenomics, you know, people worry sometimes about like the mainnet tokens and it's like, look, people shouldn't be worried about the token faucet. Um, like that's actually the growth strategy. Um, there is, uh, like it's in, it's people should go to, if they're curious about the actual breakdown, go to wiki.sato.io and go and look at the tokenomics and it, it like it breaks down and says, this is what the tokens are for. 
Um, and what they'll see is they'll see like ERC-20 right now, uh, it's 3 billion. And as the network moves to full token persistence after that point, we can start introducing things through the ad faucet. We're not realistically looking at anything like this, I think for the next year and a half, two years, because we're decently funded. Um, and also we're busy, so. Right. Yeah, no, that was a good, I just wanted to ask that real quickly. I wasn't. Um, wasn't no, 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 it, it's fine. I mean, it's not like we're not communicative. A lot of people, it's like, really, it's not a problem. Like, it's not the problem we've got to deal with now. You know, like the, mm -hmm. the problems we're dealing with now is like, you take a look at the arcade and you're like, why don't people want to play this game? Why don't people want to play this game? How do we make this game better because people are using it? Um, so uh, for the games right now on Red Square, I actually have, I, I made an account and stuff just to check it out, but I haven't played any games. Do you, is there, are you rewarded in uh, Sato like for victories? No, not, not now. I mean, okay. we, we can look at it. So we're thinking like, we don't want to do this play to earn crap because it, uh, it's not real. Um, we're, we've got people who come organically um, and we're trying to figure out like how to make it better. Um, and it does need to be better and we're working on it. Um, it would also just spam the network mm -hmm. in some regard too, right? You, you'd have transactions that really didn't need to be there. Well, well, yeah, sure. But they're going to get pruned by ETR. So who cares? A zero right. fee transaction that hits the end of the chain. Who, who cares if your poker move is on there? Like, it's gone. Um, yeah. it gets compressed into that block hash, which can be kept for eternity because it's like 32 bytes. Okay. Um, uh, the question was about. Well, we were. Still, I think we we're still on tokenomics. <laughs> a play to earn. Um, oh, here's yeah, what yeah. we can do. Like when the ad faucet comes along, if you're playing on the network and you're playing the games, you're going to get some tokens, right? Like watch an ad. Like we don't even need to run the ad faucet, um, and so people will be funded in that sense to use the network generally. And then those tokens get used in transactions. We got a lot of ideas, you know, like uh, there's a community driven magic game, magic style game, uh, we're calling it Realms, um, kind of like the magic card game. And we can do things like, well, if you've played this game, we can incentivize you by giving you a rare card. Or we can unlock additional features if people play. But we really like, we don't want to go down to play to earn also because like, it's just scammy fake activity. And it Before also, I look like, at play to earn, I, I definitely agree with you. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And we, there's some great games. Twilight Struggle is a great game. There's more great games that are coming on. Um, you know, UI is, it's a work in progress, we'll say. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, people can see, and I think if you look at it now compared to even six months ago, um, you know, it's like, it's week by week, there's progress. Like you can go in games. And one of the, one of the things I love now is we've got like, video chatting games because you can use the blockchain to do a zoom call like this the blockchain just helps us connect across a network if we don't know our ip addresses then we've got a peer-to-peer -peer connection i can add you as a peer so we can play game on Saito and we can integrate video chat you guys need to add me on there because i saw the video chat feature he's talking about the application the other day and i don't have any friends yet so i'm at pittsburgh hodler on there Go ahead and add me. They're alienated. <laughs> they, they left you as soon as they heard. That, I've got no friends out there in uh, the virtual world. Uh, all right, yeah. let's move. Let's move to the Twitter questions real fast. Uh, so I don't keep you more than an hour here. If we could just do like maybe uh, ninety seconds for each of these. Just like I'll, I'll try to be fast. Okay. I'm not in a super hurry. If you want to stretch over a bit, but all right. So coming from Sam Yu on Twitter, what is the importance of openness in decentralization? What's the meaning of decentralization? It's stuff spread out in space. Amazon's farm servers are spread out in space. Does that mean that they're suitable for running a monetary system? You know, what's happened is Bitcoin is open because volunteers run the peer to peer network. And because volunteers run the peer to peer network, it's decentralized. So people have the causal arrow reversed. They think anything that's decentralized is going to be open. And it's like, well, the Fed is decentralized. Like Federal Bank of Pittsburgh, right. you know, Federal Bank, they're de like they're separated in space. That doesn't make, make them open. Um, uh, not, not a rant, but that's the answer. The answer is that people who talk about decentralization as if it's openness, they're mm -hmm. telling you they can't tell the difference. And that's problematic because it means they can't see clearly 
where the problems are coming from that will make decentralized systems permissioned. And that's what's happening in proof of stake. I like that that a lot. That's a good analogy. Uh, I'm going to give you the Halloween analogy. Have I, have you heard it yet? No. Okay. If you take the Hershey factory and you break it up and decentralize it, you don't get free chocolate. That's what (laughs) Ethereum is trying to do. Yeah. That's another Pennsylvania analogy. Okay. I like that. (laughs) <laughs> um, okay Pennsylvania. i didn't know that <laughs> hershey pa that was, that was the joke uh all right so moving on to the next one we got uh no and nova here dot e uh not sure why it's not dot sato yet uh wh- where uh let's see what is this question what is sato's main value proposition i think we've we've covered that but if you fundamental problems yeah and we think it matters we think that matters okay uh leap of faith, but yeah, I think we've met, we, that we that was pretty much the emphasis of the show, but I didn't want to leave him out here. Uh, Maxime from Twitter at Hold Sado. My question would be, what is their recruitment plan? Oh, I mean, we're so we're really busy, um, and I think the bear market has been nice. And I don't want to say COVID has been nice, but um, yeah, we haven't really thought about it. Uh, if people are interested in helping us, please. Uh, and, you know, the, the biggest challenge for us with recruitment is finding people who care about Saito. Very good. Because like, if, if you're reaching out into the job market, you're getting people who the crypto people are like, oh, I know Solidity. Oh, I know this. And, you know, they don't they don't know Saito. The people that know Saito are really valuable to us. Yeah, like I, I've not, we've noted and I, I think I talked from the onset here. Um, you guys have a very uh, passionate fan base or community for sure. Cult following almost here. Uh, when they- people see the problems, it's really hard to unsee them because you look at these other networks and you realize that they're like, oh, well, the private sector will take care of that. And when you stop believing that, like when you stop believing that giving anything to the free market is going to make it work, it's like, yeah, like markets fail. It's called market failures. They're called collective action problems, you know? Um, this is something yeah. interesting that I heard you talking about in a prior uh, podcast that we may just disagree on a little bit because you call it a market failure, uh, which it is in some in some regards. But the free market is actually solving the problem because you're coming in and fixing it. So it's it's it just depends on it's on, it depends on scope. I mean, I mean, people people like making these meta arguments. And I mean, the, the message I'd say to you is because you're a free market guy, I'm a free market guy too. And I'd say one of the real problems is libertarians hate the idea of market failures and like to argue against it. Right. And it's like, look, accept that there are market failures because then we can fix them. You know, and it's like if we're arguing, if market failures exist, no one's going to take us seriously. And if we start building technical platforms and we're in denial that these market failures exist, that's like the blockchain bloat problem. That's a market failure. Yeah, I think like it's just, people, I think I think it's yeah. just basically semantics as well. Although we're we're uh, we're uh, we're different on. Uh... No, no, no. I mean, I I get it. Um, yeah. you know, I I I do have an economics bad. It's it's like it's the thing that can be frustrating for me dealing with like uh, especially BTC libertarian maxis because you're kind of like, look, guys, we can solve this problem. And they're like, what do you mean? Who's going to build the roads? And it's like we don't want to have a discussion about that. Or it's like blaming Keynes. And it's like, don't blame Keynes. He was probably right. What you should do is you should say Keynes would love crypto because clearly the trusted third party system that Keynesianism relies upon is broken. Like you just can't trust the central, you can't trust the Fed. You can't trust the central planners. They don't have the best interest of the economy. Like it's so obvious. You don't need to argue against Keynes. You can say, well, that's great, but it's clearly irrelevant. Like you I said, think- we, we don't need these people uh, in control of our money with, the, you know, the central, these centralized institutions are dying. We know that already. So we, we can't trust them. I mean, isn't that Satoshi's thing? It's why do you need per- openness? Why do you need permissionless? Because it's money. Like you're asking them to manage something that they can put in their pocket and go and buy a yacht with. And it belongs to you. Right. Like that's why you need trustlessness. And this is one of the dangers of closure. Like people are like, oh, well, we, we got smart contracts and we're just, you know, it's a little bit of a sacrifice. And it's like, well, at what point does it become a problem? Absolutely. You and I can have another debate or a conversation sometime about economics. I think that would be a fun one, actually. You and I probably have a good conversation about that. Um, probably agree. You, no, I think we do for the 
I think we do for the most part. Yeah, I think we're definitely on the same page. We, yeah, we're definitely on the same page. Um, what? Just a couple more of these. What does uh, what does he envision for the future of blockchain? What do you what do you what do you I guess what do you see uh, looking out? They didn't say this, but let's just look out like ten years from now. What do you uh, what do you think it'll look like? A vast ocean of permission shit coins and central bank digital currencies. I definitely and a couple of open networks that are like Cyto serious about solving the problems. Because if we can't do that, all we can get with openness is small scale networks. And if all we can do is small scale networks, that's okay. Cause it's better than the alternative, but it's better if we can have something that can have a real network effect. Well said, sir. Uh, uh, Darth Maul 66 here. What will, uh, what will bring Sato into the top three? I think we can get top 50 on fundamentals as people understand, because I think as people understand, they realize like, it, you know, talking about market cap and ranks, it's like shilling. I don't want to shill. Right. Like the, the reason Cyto matters is not because of the market cap. If right. someone is working on another project, the reason it matters is because there are things that we do and the ways of understanding the problem that when you understand it can help you. Right. Like look into ATR. Anyone working on smart contracts should be saying, okay, rebroadcasting is how layer one has to manage state. And if we've got smart contract state, then if something falls off layer one, what do we do? And what are our options for automatically pruning stuff layer two, if layer one, if the guy deletes it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, if I look at the crypto ranks, I think, you know, people think top 10, it means it's really important. And I think that where we are right now is people are beginning to understand Cyto and they're beginning to realize actually there is something new here. Uh, and it's kind of like when DAGs came out because DAGs are new and DAGs matter. I like and charting, yeah, they're, they're good. It's, you know, it's kind of like if you want a small scale network that's run by volunteers, mm -hmm. a fee free DAG is a good thing. But yeah. like, if you're telling me it's going to be the global currency, I'm not going to believe you. Right. You know, because you're, if you're running it off someone's Raspberry Pi in the basement, like actually, yeah, you do have some problems with that. <laughs> like, you know, but it's good. It, it's not negative. Um, no, they, yeah, they, so, they, they even optimize those for smaller, smaller operations. I agree with you on that for sure. And that, that's maybe that's the best we can do. Like we, we don't know. We know the abstract properties that Cyto protects. It protects openness and self-sufficiency. We really don't know where that gets us because there's nothing else, there's nothing out there. And it's kind of like going back to Bitcoin where Satoshi's like in 20 years, it'll be massive transactions or none. And, you know, it's kind of the same. We think Saito is either going to succeed spectacularly or we're going to learn what's broken with it. And both of those are worthwhile things to aim for. And, you know, and we got to educate. Um, anyway, so for market cap, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, I think we're going to grow as people understand, because I can't imagine anyone understanding what we're doing and being like, hmm, we don't care about solving the 51% attack. Like, how would you do that? What, like, because the 51%, it means you're half as secure and you're four times as expensive. Like, how are you going to compete? And you're not even competing with us. You're competing with this, like the permission shit coins, so to speak. Because those things are adding closure like there's no tomorrow. They've got like five block producers and every single dollar you spend doesn't go to stakers. It goes to the network. Like they're super cheap. They're cheaper than Saito. They're the real threat. Like, because we need to, we need to charge fees and we need to burn some of them. We don't need to burn all of them. But like the goal should be to get as much money as possible into the hands of the routing nodes that are facing users. Because yeah, I I commend you guys for what you're trying to do because there's no way to find out whether your idea works until you build it and try to break it yeah. basically. So yeah, yeah, that's, there's no way to know this stuff yet. Uh, Mook, M-U-K, Mooking about, uh, asked this question. I'm sure you recognize some of these guys because there's some of your, uh, yeah. your admirers on them. Some of them are red pill, you know? <laughs> the red pills, yes. <laughs> just a few. He asked about P PKI stuff and how blockchain can aid it. I mean, every, if you got a private key and public key, you've got an account on a PKI network, like the Apple App Store. And like the Apple App Store, they could put money in a database and have people spend it like a bank. Um, I think it's, 
because we're serious about scale, we're building applications like Red Square, like the video stun, like the blockchain peer-to-peer -peer connect that other networks won't do or can't do because they're terrified of letting people put data on chain. But any PKI network can do what Saito is doing. And so how we have to compete long-term is by being the network that is trustless because it's open and self-sufficient. And maybe that means there are applications on it that you want to use that like Infura won't let you use for whatever reason. Or maybe it's because those two properties make you a form of money. And we learn in 10 years that like as any proof of stake network that adds closure, there's a point of, of control. Like okay. answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's the, it's, it's consent. It's the, it's the network that matters, not the applications you can build with them, except the scale of the network gives you the network effect. And it may be, we need maximum scale layer one, because that's maximum network effect. Maximum network effect is maximum value utility of network. And that's what gives us the, the token ultimately value store value. And maybe that gives us money. Excellent. This is from Alex. Uh, he says, you guys, have, let's see, he says, uh, you talk, okay, uh, participating in real life conferences, you guys have any anticipate or any plans to um, uh, do any in real life stuff? Uh, it sounds like in the future here. Uh, like we've been, um, we spoke at economy. It's, I don't think it's really useful for us where we are. Like we'll do it. Um, one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to be in the pay to play game. And that's what a lot of these industry conferences are. Right. Um, for us at the early stage, it was about building credibility. Um, and we'd have friends like, I, I think, you know, we were, you know, I think we, one of the reasons we were on the panel at economy is because we took on-chain scaling seriously. Um, you know, so, but uh, anyway, anyway um, yeah, we're open to it. We don't want to spend a ton of money to appear. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to catalyze people with the information so that people actually invite us because the, the places people invite us are the places we want to be. The places where it's like you're, it's expected that you're a shit coin are exactly the places where our message gets diluted by people's expectations. Um, anyway. In all honesty, I'm not a huge fan of conferences myself. I, I, I really would rather miss those. Um, so I think I think there's probably more value in something like this, to be honest with you, where we can just talk and um, you can get questions, answer yeah. questions from the community rather than just giving up, standing up there and giving the same speech every time or, you know, you know what I'm saying? I'd really, I'd really like to go to a board game conference at some point, a <laughs> small one, because the game engines moving in that direction with a lot of sophistication um like real-time moves and something like that might be way more better it might be way better for us than like uh, a blockchain conference right um you know that means we're open to it it's uh it's it's you know covid we're not going to go right. um we'll okay. see i'm hoping and we get to stanford i like the stanford blockchain conference you should come if you haven't no, I've never been to that. I've, I've I've seen some. I think I saw some. Man, way back the uh, stamp. I used to watch the Stanford uh, Bitcoin lecture. I'm talking like this must have been. Mm. I don't know how many years ago, but it's been a long time. Um, I definitely watched some of the Stanford stuff back in the day. I think it was. Uh, the community is more open-minded and idealistic. I think you'd like it. Like it's it, the Silicon Valley has this really heavy bias towards proof of stake because they miss Bitcoin. You know. Right. So proof of stake comes along and it's like crypto, they want it to be proof of stake because God, if it's not proof of stake, like then they missed the boat. And I think they, I think they're kind of missing the boat, but like, oh, that's uh, a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And so, you know, the proof of stake investment, so Stanford, you know, it's, it's leaning in that direction. You get, uh, you get, there's totally a bias there, but they're smart people. And I think West coast, it's the place to be. So I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping we can go and talk and that there will be people who are interested in what we have to say. But, yeah, if you head out there, man, let me know. I might meet you out there sometime. Uh, Dev yeah. Rim. Amazing. Your... Amazing tacos. <laughs> Dev Rim, uh, it's 992. We got three left here. Uh, and then we're wrapping up. What uh, What's happening behind the scenes and what, what what are you specifically working on like right now? Like what did you what did you work on in the last week? Maybe I don't know. What did I work on last week? So <clears throat> we've been refactoring. Uh, it's on staging now. You can see it. It's going to go to prod soon. I was dealing with things like chat in mobile where 
the old version, the one you've been using, like the mobile experience is really bad. Chat kind of pops up. So I was today I was dealing with things like uh, you click on the hamburger menu in mobile, little chat button, you click there, you get the chat manager in mobile, you click on it, it opens a full pane, uh, full screen thing. We've been doing more usability stuff. We're also trying to simplify because I think one of the problems we've had as a dev team is we've approached a lot of our early features as demos. And we throw them out and we see like, will people use this? Will they not use it? And I think that was the right thing to do because we learned like the forum, nobody used it. Red Square people did use it. But you know, if you've got five ways of doing things and three of them are broken, the team's happy because they know how to do things, but users run into problems. So a lot of the work uh, lately has been refactor. It's on staging. It's going to go to prod really soon. Uh, lots of other application stuff. Um, I'm more on applications these days than uh, the Rust stuff. Uh, I'm assuming I'll be going back in about two, three weeks. Sanka keeps sending the Toby McGuire GIFs every time he needs to touch Webpack. So he's great though. Uh, That's a great answer. Two more. And then I got my, my wrap up question. Uh, a DEX, what are you guys, are you guys, you guys want to build your own DEX? Are you working on a DEX? I didn't, no, no, a DEX, you need a smart contract layer. We don't want to build a smart contract layer. What I meant by that comment is people are like, what about this? What about that? And look, at Uniswap. With MetaMask, people are paying the Uniswap fees and the Ethereum fees. And they're also now paying like, uh, almost a percent in a hidden fee that Infure is charging, right? Like this is part of the Sato reason. Like people like to pretend that these fees don't exist. And it's like, they do. You're paying the MEV and you're paying, like it's just really expensive. Now, if someone just wants Sato buying or selling it and we've got Red Square and we've got applications, we can put a function in there that allows people to buy and sell Sato right on Red Square. And it doesn't need to be us because it's an open application platform. Anybody could create that application. If someone else wanted to do it, I will run it, you know, and they could have someone sitting there with a gate account with Saito and just buy and sell for you. And if they did it at like a zero, you know, half a percentage fee, they'd be, they'd be destroying every, they'd be destroying Uniswap. So, uh, you know, I was saying that there are options and I think people say, oh, if you're buying and selling through the, like through Saito, it must be a DEX. It's like, you know, we, we, I don't, we wouldn't do that. Um, like we don't have, we don't have the team size or the resources to build an EVM at this point. And I think our strategy is sound, which is to wait for the proof of stake people to finish killing each other mm -hmm. and then look at what is the best open source version and then just park it on, park it on nodes. Okay. Yeah, the last the last one here is from Square, and it's about routing signatures. And I think we've probably already done pretty <laughs> done that justice. So uh, yeah. thanks everybody that had the questions. You guys are awesome, and thanks to David. I got one last question. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we've already talked about this quite quite a bit as well. But I ask everybody mm -hmm. that comes on what Bitcoin means to them, and then obviously I'll ask you what Sato means to you. Well, let me answer Bitcoin first in solidarity. Bitcoin is an open door that changed the world. And what Saito is for me is the idea that the problems that are causing other, the problems with it are causing people to make bad trade-offs and justify it as it's unsolvable and Bitcoin doesn't do any better. And so for me, Saito is fundamentals matter. We can actually see how this can play out. Um, uh, it's a joy. It's a joy to be able to work on something that matters, and I think that's a gift that Satoshi gave uh, everyone who got involved. And I feel that I'm hoping that Saito can give the same kind of gift to people. Um, uh, yeah, you know, people research us. We're we're very sincere, um, and we love engagement. So thank you again for asking questions and bringing me on to either explain or rant, depending on. The question. No, I didn't feel like you were raining. I appreciate that. Hmm. Yeah, it was a, it was an enlightening talk. Um, hopefully, we can do it again in the future. And I wish you guys nothing but the best in 2023. Yeah, same. And I mean, thanks for the support. Thanks, honestly, for reaching out proactively because uh, you know it, it, it's great. And if you're if you're a crypto project on on Telegram or Twitter, you know, 
if someone messaged you, the chances are they're trying to show you something. Uh, so it's kind of refreshing when someone's like, actually, I'm interested in learning more. It's <laughs> such a great way to reach out to people, you know? Yeah. So every once in a while, somebody will uh, report me or something, maybe when I go in and try to uh, approach you like I did on Telegram, they'll, th they'll think that like automatically you're a scammer because yeah, it's, it's, oh, this guy is shilling a YouTube <laughs> video or I've got an AMA offer that's good for you. That's yeah. that's eighty to ninety percent. I know. And it's, yeah. So thanks thanks for taking the time and uh, not writing me off when I when I uh, slid into your DMs on there. Yeah. No man, it, it's it's a joy. Thanks, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Eh? Abs absolutely. Hang on one sec. I'll say a proper proper goodbye.